Well, thanks very much for that. It's wonderful to see all of you here. It's great to be here with my friend David, um, who drives me crazy with these. Okay? And first of all, David's figured out something I never figured out, which was that if you write fiction, as opposed to being accused of writing fiction, which you know, <laughs> so, uh, uh, another, uh, another problem that all of us journalists have. <clears throat> but if you actually write actual fiction, there are no footnotes. You don't, <laughs> that, that saves six months right there. Um, you can make up dialogue. Um, you can uh, imagine what's going on in the uh, director's office of uh, the CIA, rather than actually having to try to pry out of people what's going on. The truly annoying part of this is that when David does this in novelistic form, I usually feel he has gotten closer to the truth than the rest of us have gotten when we're trying to do this in nonfiction form. And actually, when the increment came out, which posited an operation against Iran, I was writing Confront and Conceal, which had a lot of the same technology in it, but David beat me to it by at least a year and a half uh, before we got around to, to revealing a US cyber operation on, on Iran. So speaking of cyber, that is really the star of the director. If any of you haven't read this, there are copies out front. We can solve that problem for you for just a small price. Um, but um, I was thinking on my way over here, David, that <clears throat> Graham Weber, who is the fictional CIA director here, sort of placed in the job as something of a neophyte to um, the intelligence world and is going through this process of discovery as you as the reader go through it is the exact opposite of John Brennan, who in an hour will be going on giving the first live televised press conference from the CIA to go explain their position on the torture report. And we'll come back on this. But let me start you just with a couple of characters here and ask you about them so that you can sort of situate them in the book. And then we'll go to the real world. So tell us how you imagined Graham Weber here. Um, no one would ever say that the Graham Weber was drawn from life and John Brennan. I can't imagine two <laughs> people uh, more different. As you were going through that uh, wonderful introduction about fact and fiction, uh, I was reminded of a Mel Brooks line on one of the 2,000-year-old man uh, recordings where he says, Mel, you found me out. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, I've been I've been exposed. Um, we'll talk more about 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 fact and fiction and, and combining them. I just want to uh, say at the outset a couple of uh, thank yous. Uh, first to Alma. Uh, Alma Gildenhart is, is an institution of, of this organization and in Washington. She has been a wonderful friend to me and my wife. Uh, I'm sorry that her. her Marvelous husband Joe is not here, but I uh, send best wishes to him. Um, she's one of the people who, um, you know, holds up the, the sky here in Washington in terms of making good things happen. And I just, it's really wonderful to, to be invited by you. Um, this is an amazing audience for me. It has it seated around this room my best friend from college, Garrett Epps, still, still my closest friend. My tennis partner, uh, Deanne Strauss Tucker, who I always try to, to play up to, who's one of the best uh, tennis players in Washington, is national champion um, in, uh, in 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 platform uh, t uh, tennis, the headmaster of the boys' school that I attended, St. Albans School, which is you know pretty pretty nerve wracking even now. <laughs> Um, the wife of my uh, sailing BFF, best friend forever, Robin West. Um, my producer, uh, Jerry Rashoon. I mean, I could go on. There are a lot of people in the audience, but this is so it's a special audience. So I really have to be careful what I say because I, I, I will get in trouble. Um, and my friend David Sanger, with, with whom I uh, love to compete. I mean, one of the great things, it's really crazy to be in our business unless you like to duke it out and, um, you know, compete with somebody who is really smart like David to break 
news to understand what's going on. Uh, Dave and I are both lucky to be associated with the Harvard Kennedy School and to have done some teaching there with our friend and mentor, uh, Graham Allison. So uh, it's, it's great to be up on the platform with David and uh, we're gonna inflict on each other going to China tomorrow, yeah? Not me. They, you they, not going? they turned down my visa. <laughs> if you'd stuck to fiction, this never would have happened. <laughs> tried to tell you, take out the footnotes. So, um, just to say a little bit about, about this, about this uh, novel, um, and the, the, the lead character is a newly appointed CIA director uh, named Graham Weber, who comes out of the communications industry. Uh, who has uh, defied the kind of surveillance state, if you will, by refusing to accept a national security letter, which is how the FBI compels disclosure of information from communications companies because he says he thinks it's unconstitutional. So he stood up to the, to the FBI. The book opens with him giving a speech uh, at a hacker's convention in the company of a brilliant young CIA uh, analyst uh, named James Morris. And uh, it comes to the attention of, of the pre president who wants to be seen as reforming, shaking up a CIA that's been shattered by the Snowden revelations, by this is a post-Snowden novel, just, just in time. Um, and so he appoints uh, this man, Graham Weber, this businessman who's got his, his civil liberties credentials in order. And at the end of uh, Graham Weber's first week on the job running the CIA, into our consulate in Hamburg walks uh, a young man, a young Swiss man, uh, in a dirty uh, hoodie uh, with a tattoo around his neck that says, in Russian, cut here. And he stumbles in, the, the, the CIA base chief you know, has to look, it's been so long since they had a walk-in defector, you've got to look and see what are the procedures for handling somebody like this. Um, and uh, she takes him upstairs and he says, you've been hacked. Your communication systems have been broken by my friends, the people I've been working with. And here as evidence is a list of the names of all of your officers in Germany and Switzerland and the cryptonyms that conceal their identities. You've been hacked. And so uh, my CIA director has to deal in that first uh, blush of trying to shake up the place. First thing he does, what he gets there is take the statue, many of you have probably seen in the lobby uh, of, of Wild Bill Donovan, the founder, uh, he removes it, thinking, you know, that, that, that'll disorient people. He, he says it's, he's taking it away for cleaning, but it never comes back. So in, in, the, in the first blush of this effort to change things, he's confronted with the biggest nightmare that a CIA director can have, which is the, the warning that uh, your systems of communication have been, have been penetrated and you are vulnerable to your adversaries. And so the story of the, of the book, uh, Weber, not surprisingly, because he's known this brilliant young man uh, who, who's been a hacker in his youth, who's known by the hacker nickname Ponzor, which means uh, we own you, I own you, I pwn you. Um, turns to him uh, thinking he's the smart guy who's going to get, get me out of this mess. And if you want to know more about that, you're just going to have to read the book. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I could be happy to talk more about the book, but it's basically, you know, David, this began, gosh, you know, in early 2012 with uh, my sense that um, what lay ahead uh, was the intersection of, of hacking and espionage. That, you know, for a spy novelist, all the themes that you write about in a spy novel, think of all the classic themes of Tinker Taylor, Soldier Spy, or The Spy Who Came In From the Cold about uh, penetration, moles, uh, you know, manipulation, deception, that all those um, 
themes were going to go into zeros and ones, if you will, that, all, that it was going to be about um, stealing the other uh, side's systems, penetrating, you know, not, not recruiting the chief of the service, recruiting the systems administrator. Uh, divulging those details, that that was the frontier of espionage and the kind of thing that a spy novelist should try to get his mind around. And uh, it, it, it took, um, you know, more than a year of research and traveling and going to hackers conventions, things I can talk about if David wants to, to ask. But just to conclude this, um, you know, as I, as I was finishing the first draft of this novel, along came Edward Snowden. Uh, his first disclosures were in May uh, of 2013. And I, I looked at the first draft of this book and I thought, wow, real life is so much more interesting than the book you've just written. You have a problem, David. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I, I began desperate attempts to rewrite this book. I've said other places a little bit about that and, and the role of my friends, Garrett, uh, sitting in the audience, my wife, Eve, who's a computer scientist, in saying after I gave the second rewrite, um, you're not there yet. And thank goodness uh, I got that, that advice. So anyway, that's a little bit about, about the book and how it came to be. Well, that's terrific. And you know, I've been to some of those hackers' conventions, and David's portrayal of them is really terrific. At some point during the book signing, he'll have to explain to you the hackers scene in Hamburg or Berlin? Berlin. Berlin, in the, where the hackers end up in an S&M club with a lot of leather on. And you know, how that reporting happened, we'll have to discuss in a completely different forum. It's really not suitable for the Aspen Institute. Uh, you know, I, I think I heard you say that I'll have to explain that. That's not true, actually. I won't, I, I won't have to explain that. But um, let me take you to some of the uh, let me take you to some of the the bigger themes in here. One of the things that struck me about the book was that this neophyte CIA director who comes in with all these ideas about reforming the agency um, suddenly discovers, thanks to this walk in, thanks to the hack of the CIA, that his operation, and to a greater degree, America's relationships in the countries that are dealing with here, including Germany, are being driven by the technology more than by the political forces who think that they're running the country. That the technology has caused a disruption that they're always running to catch up. And I'm just wondering, as you look across the world today, to what degree you actually see that happening in the relationships the United States is trying to maintain? Um, uh, let me make uh, two comments. You know, first about about reporting a, a book like this. Um, you know, part of the fun of being a novelist is that you um, you know get to imagine um, you know wildly different uh, scenes than any you uh, know or even ha have, have, have seen. I mean, you know, just for a, a, a man to write a, a, a woman's character in a con convincing way uh, or, or, or a woman to write a man's character, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating. When I first began as a novelist, this is my ninth book, you know, just that, you know, the, the act of imagining and, and being believable in the voice of all these different people was, um, you know, was a huge challenge, and, and it still is. And for me, you know, the internet allows you to go places. You know, I, I've never been to these places in, in Berlin, but I sure have seen them online, and I know I know a lot about them. Yeah, and you know, that's the great thing about the, about the internet. I sometimes wonder if anybody was actually watching my internet <laughs> activity when I was researching this book. <laughs> I would have been arrested. We actually have a list. Uh. <laughs> um, so, you know, the technology um, is is a driver um, in relations between countries. But just look at the at the Snowden 
revelations, uh, for an example. Um, one of the things that um, I learned during the research for this book was that the NSA, really uh, two decades ago, uh, realized that to, to keep up with technology, they needed younger people. Uh, I mean, you know, the NSA is a military organization. Fort Meade is a fort. You go out there and you see a lot of people in uniform. But th that they would need to find people who had the hacker uh, ethos, you know, that, that restless, crazy, uh, almost anarchic uh, curiosity about the world. And so if you, if you visit Fort Meade, you will see uh, walking down the corridors, at least this was true when I was working on the book, I don't know if it still is, you know, people in black t-shirts and ear studs and, you know, looking for all the world like people at a hackers convention. And not surprisingly, when those people came into uh, the NSA establishment, they pushed out the technology in, you know, I mean, hackers want to hack everything. It's just part of the, the fun. It's a sport. It's like, you know, climbing Everest because it's there. So if, you, if there's something you can get inside, if there's a secret you can steal, if there's a, a cell phone that you can find a way to, 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 to identify and capture, uh, you know, there, there is that hacker spirit that says, go do it. And in this vast uh, secret military bureaucracy, it turns out, there weren't good controls on the combination of the traditional NSA people and these new um, uh, hackers who'd been, who'd been brought in. And, you know, so you, you see how you know, there is something of the sorcerer's apprentice. I mean, just how, how wildly creative they were in advancing uh, the frontiers of, of, of what information they could grab. And, and there wasn't a lot of, of, I think we would now say, there wasn't a lot of adult supervision of that. It's, and it's, you know, I mean, secret bureaucracies uh, are bureaucratic, which means they just sort of grow and reproduce, but they're secret. So it's very hard with all, all these different compartments to, to, to understand and control what's going on. So, you know, I think uh, for our country, but I'm sure this is also true of China and the activities of the PLA hackers. I'm sure it's true uh, of, you know, I suspect it's true of, of, of India. I'm sure it's true of Russia, where there seems to be a kind of, um, a continuum between the people who've done work in the kind of underground that steals credit cards and people who were who were employed by the security services in all these c countries the technology itself is it's just it moves so quickly there's a Moore's law of intelligence you know it just it it, it keeps expanding and replicating so much faster than you would have thought so and I think uh, just to, to conclude the challenge for our government uh, of finding a way to oversee this so that uh, reasonable rules are put in place that do everything they can to keep the country safe, but also control this you know, tech, tech, technological push that left to itself will just keep expanding. I think it's, it's, it's um, we've only begun to think about that. Well, one of the things you capture in the book so well, David, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about one of the big differences with traditional espionage is that traditional espionage as we knew it during the Cold War was by and large government against government. So um, there were moments, of course, where we wanted to get inside uh, a Soviet you know, factory, or they wanted to get inside a defense contractor. But by and large, they were stealing secrets from each other's governments. And while your book begins there, it certainly doesn't end up there. It spreads out. And you think about just the past four months. We have seen five months. We've seen hacking into uh, Target and Home Depot for the most traditional thing, credit card numbers. We've seen the unclassified systems of the White House and the State Department penetrated. Seen this rather remarkable hack of Sony Corporation, which I suspect this week is a lot more interested in the movie version of your book than they would have been, say, a month ago. They, they actually bought the movie version of my book, and I'm waiting to see the email traffic surrounding the purchase get yeah. disclosed online. Yeah. 
let's hope that they're nicer to you in their internal emails than they were to Angelina Jolie this morning. Well, <laughs> you know, shudder. Um, the, uh, I won't say any more about that. Um, so uh, anybody who wants to see the early cuts of the, of the director as a movie can probably get them on the web tonight, right? <laughs> they, 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 they hired, uh, they've just hired a screenwriter. The screenplay has not been written, but um, the, the people who figured in the purchase of this, I don't know if you read the story in the Times this morning, were Amy Pascal, the head of Sony Pictures, uh, Mike DeLuca, who's one of her key associates, who's, who's mentioned, um, Scott Rudin, uh, who figures prominently in the story this morning. Um, and you know, I, I, I'm just confident that when it came to purchasing the director, they exchanged notes that said, wow, what a great book, let's buy it. And the response was, absolutely right, done. And that's all there is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so talk a little bit about how this realm that we're trying to defend has expanded. So let's say it was a foreign power, we don't know yet it was, that got into Sony. Is that a commercial cybersecurity problem? Is that a national security problem? Especially if it was, in fact, a state done hack. Is there a point, you know, what's the dividing line here between when you have to say this is private industry's problem and when, as happens in the director, you end up having to have National Security Council meetings about a, a penetration. Well, it's 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 both. Uh, it, it, the theft of intellectual property uh, from private companies, which has been going on for several decades, is a you know is a is a real uh, economic loss to them. It's also a national security uh, pr problem for the for the U.S. Um, I think the interesting uh, uh, dilemma that's ahead is that, uh, that the companies that have been subject to electronic uh, attack, both by foreign governments, uh, China in this case, North Korea is uh, thought to have maybe been behind the, the Sony hack. Um, uh, Iran is widely suspected of uh, uh, cyber attack on Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's uh, suspected that they may have been up behind this very aggressive attack on banks. So these foreign governments and also um, uh, the attacks on private data, if you will, that have been conducted by the U.S. government through NSA uh, programs. Private companies are going to respond um, to those dangers in ways that severely complicate life for the U.S. government. Uh, that's already already happened uh, as uh, data is encrypted with, with strong encryption, which makes it much more difficult to obtain, even if you have a search warrant, even if you have uh, legal reason to uh, think that a particular uh, email account, individual, you know, under standard in intelligence collection or law enforcement procedures should be accessible, it may now be encrypted in a way that makes it much more difficult to, to, to get at. And that's because uh, companies have been protecting themselves, protecting their secrets, trying to reassure. I mean, if you're Sony, you need this week to be saying to everybody in the entertainment industry, everybody you, deal, you do business with, um, this will never happen again. Your communications with us are safe. You know, you just have to. It's a condition of doing business going forward. And there'll be no way to do that without a much stronger encryption. Uh, you know, that, that's the world that we're, we're going to live in and probably should. I just would note that it comes with complications. I mean, you know, for law enforcement, let's put aside the intelligence issues. Let's just talk about a murder suspect. You know, on the LA police, just reading the, the latest uh, Harry Bosch novel, you know, the, the, the LA police pings somebody who's a suspect and identifies where the cell phone is, and then Harry Bosch goes and chases him. Well, that's not going to be so easy. That simple law enforcement technique that's become uh, almost universal in the world that we're entering. Well, in your book, you have a character who's supposed to go navigate that world. His name is James Morris. You referred to him before. He was the, the, the young guy who met the director first, I think, at the hacking conference and then is brought in. 
And uh, I won't go too much about him because he becomes a more and more interesting character as the book goes on. But um, he seems to encapsulate this world that the intelligence agencies have had to handle where in order to do their business, they've got to go deal with, hire, use the talents of people who 10 years ago never would have gotten past the first 30 minutes of a security clearance, right? Well, uh, they, they, they do have to do that, and um, they, they're struggling now to think how they get the, the best and the brightest from the world of, of hacking and also um, prevent the next Edward Snowden. How do they have systems that monitor what you're seeing? I mean, you talk about giving away your privacy. Uh, you know, p people who work in the intelligence community are in such an intrusive environment now that I I've heard top US intelligence officials express concern. Nobody's gonna wanna work here because everything you do, every transaction you make, every you know, step, baby step you take, electronically is going to be visible and has to be so they'll, they, 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 they catch the, uh, the, next, the next person. Um, James Morris was, a, was, a, was a, a fascinating character to uh, research for two reasons. First, just that this world of, of, of world-class hackers is so interesting and scary. The convention that, that David mentioned that I went to is called DEF CON. Uh, it's been going on for 20 years. DEF CON has used to be a you know, term of nuclear strategy. You went to DEF CON 3. Anyway, they, they stole that 20 years ago. And, um, uh, so y you walk into the convention center in Las Vegas at the Rio Hotel, and th there are 10,000 of the strangest looking people you've ever seen. I mean, uh, and um, you know, if you don't think a 60-year-old guy uh, wasn't wearing my blue suit and my red tie, but I might as well have been. If you don't think you stick out, you know, forget it. Uh, you, I had a, somebody who, who was my guide, who's kind of from this world, who said, David, for God's sake, um, don't bring your cell phone and don't bring your laptop, because if you do, they'll be hacked. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, but I didn't, didn't bring them. You go into the convention area, and there's this big, continuous scroll called the Wall of Sheep, for some reason. And on the Wall of Sheep, in a continuous thread, are the usernames and passwords of the accounts that are being hacked in real time. Right there. Oh, and the people just, walking around. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's continuous, and it's fast. And, you know, you know, all over this convention center are dummy Wi-Fi hotspots. If you're at the airport and, and you, you know, do a little Wi-Fi scan to see what, and some things pop up that, you know, that you think, well, what's that? Well, sometimes that's, that's a very deliberate dummy attempt to capture your signals. It's easier to connect to you than you realize. You know, you think it takes an action on your part. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. And this uh, convention opens you up to just how, um, how, how, how far uh, these skills of attack have gone. I mean, you, know, you can go to seminars on how to hack uh, elevators, how to hack your car. I mean, we all have cars with these electronic systems now. Guess what? They can be hacked. You know, the ignition can be turned off and on, the brakes, the steering. I mean, you know, this is a big issue for people who, who have to protect the president, other officials, that these, uh, you know, elevators can be made to stop or, you know, all kinds of things. Um, just the, 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 everything that's electronic and digital can be uh, attacked. And what, what's been happening, as David knows better than any, any other journalist, um, over the last 10 years, more than that for the United States. We've been in a period that the military likes to refer to as preparation of the battlefield for the possibility that someday we'll be in a cyber conflict. And that means, you know, seeing what networks are there, seeing where in those networks the key nodes that would take you to the power grid or, you know, all the other strategic 
elements of the network are. Um, sending uh, little pieces of malware that sort of stop and are digital sleeper agents to tell you where they are. You know, I'm in the grid uh, for Pepco uh, on 20th Street and, you know, uh, and then go silent and wait, you know, but they're at a particular switching point that someday could be valuable. People have been doing this to us for a long time. Uh, you know, without um, knowing the details, I just am certain we've been doing it to other people for Well, a we've long published time. some of the details, and so has the Post uh, from the Snowden. Theory. I mean, you know, right. for years, the United States was worried about Huawei, which is a maker of, Chinese maker of uh, uh, switching systems, servers, and so forth. And we now know from the Snowden material that the NSA was deep inside Huawei's own switching centers understanding how they operate so that when they sell equipment abroad, they can go into it. So, so this, this world is all already much farther along than I think most of us realize. And, um, you know, when you hear um, people in the national security world issue warnings about the dangers of cyber warfare, I'm sure you, like, like me, think, you know, why are people keep going on about this? Um, and the, the reason is that they do know things about how far advanced these techniques are and how dangerous they could be. I mean, you know, the, the ability to shut down electric power, um, financial transactions, you know, wipe out trading records. I mean, imagine what would happen if, you know, a, a major exchange or even a big bank's uh, uh, electronic records of what happened today were wiped out so that you couldn't, you didn't know what things were worth because you know, could it be reconstructed? Probably, but suppose somebody had thought of ways to go in and wipe out the backup system, and suppose the transmission lines that carried the data had been, had been targeted. So um, people who, who know about this have been worried about it for a long time. And uh, again, thinking about challenges for us as citizens, having reasonable controls in place so that, Yes, they protect us against threats that could shut down the country electronically, but they don't, in the process, become even even more intrusive uh, into the kind of you know our electronic private lives. I think that's that's the heart of the of the puzzle that that interests me. Well, one last thing for you, David, before we open it up to everybody. So, as we think about what we've learned this week, we've had this remarkable week of looking backward at one of the lowest tech, oldest techniques of intelligence agencies we've seen, and a debate over whether torture happened. If it did happen, did it yield any good data? If it did happen, did it happen with any kind of understanding on the part of the president whose instructions seem to allow this train to leave the station and so forth? And that. I was thinking this morning as I was preparing for our conversation today that you've written a book about where the heads of most people in the intelligence agencies are now and have been for years. And yet what we're watching play out is sort of like B-roll, you know, where people will look back later on the, the way we look at, at you, know, um, uh, you know, bleeding people to treat them for medical diseases in the 1800s, that, that this concept of extracting information through um, enhanced interrogation, to use their phrase, seems so incredibly medieval. Um, how do you sustain an intelligence infrastructure that on the one hand has to focus on these issues, and on the other hand is spending its time, rightly so, I would argue, trying to explain its actions in something that seems from a previous decades or century? Well, uh, the obvious answer is that uh, the CIA never should have uh, let itself get into the, the business of brutal interrogation, waterboarding, torture. Um, CIA officers at the time, uh, uh, you know, were, were desperately frightened that another attack was coming that would hit the country. Um, but sensed that uh, these techniques would shock the conscience. First, I mean, they didn't know what they were doing. And so when you read this document, they're, you know, 
they were so unprepared for what they were facing. They turned to these two consultants, two psychologists, uh, uh, you know, in, in desperation almost. And, and uh, so, so their, their, their lack of, of, of preparation is striking. But, but, they, but they, they, you know, the fact they knew there was a pr problem here is illustrated by their, their insistence that they get a legal opinion from the Justice Department. Uh, which to this day makes makes frightening reading, um, arguing that these twelve techniques, um, including waterboarding, are not torture and are legal. I mean, it's just. Um, but they got the Justice Department to write that opinion, and then they showed the opinion. They showed the the details to Condoleezza Rice, and if you really think she didn't say anything to the president um, in two thousand two before the first waterboarding, which. Uh, Senator Feinstein seems to, to think. Um, I'm skeptical, uh, frankly. I think they had policy approval from the, from the highest level. But, but, but um, even then, they had a sense, this is going to, even though we have this legal opinion, even though this, 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 uh, it's going to come back to, to, to haunt us. And they were right. And um, I think it's, it's yeah, as we were saying privately before this uh, session began, it's it's important to have intelligence officers who who ask themselves when they're given an instruction, is this legal? Is it is it moral? I have to say, there's a limit to which you want your intelligence officers or your military to say when they receive an order from their commander in chief. Uh, hold on, I got to talk to my lawyer. Uh, I mean, you know, at, at the end of the day, intelligence officers, military officers, have to, when they're given an order, they they have to carry it out. So there's a there's a, a, a tricky uh, issue here. Um, it happens. I was doing some research for something wildly different, but I was reading um, English propaganda against the Dutch in the 1600s after the Dutch in the Spice Islands uh, of Indonesia had used waterboarding against English citizens at a place called Ambonia. And uh, it was the most inflammatory issue of its time. This was in, I'm thinking, the you know, 1650s, 60s. Uh, John Dryden, the famous playwright, wrote a play about the horror of Dutch torturers and the Dutch were the worst people on earth and the barbaric Dutch with their practices. And it was waterboarding. And there's a, there's a description of water, the waterboarding of an English citizen on this island uh, in the Pacific that shocked the consciences of the, the English who read it you know, back then. And it, it just, it was a reminder that... Um, you know, how old and cruel and, and shocking this technique is. Uh, the, if anybody's interested, it's a, it's, it's a play by John Dryden. Like everything else, you can find it uh, on the internet or even order it from Amazon.com. But, uh, you know, I, I think the, our intelligence agency, I, I do believe, but over the course of my nine novels, there's a consistent theme that I think it's important for the United States to have a strong intelligence service. My first novel, Agents of Innocence, was about a really brilliant intelligence operation against terrorists, uh, Palestinian terrorists in this case, that was run by a genuine American hero who was killed when the American embassy was blown up in Beirut. And over the arc of these nine novels, I describe a CIA that, in my judgment, has gotten less and less uh, adept at doing the things that I think are important to protect the country. And that does not include waterboarding people. It, inc it includes the subtle art of recruiting people, you know, drawing them into the larger strategic designs of the United States. I think that's um, something we're not doing uh, as well as we should. It'll be even more important now when you have a world reading this torture report. And anti-Americanism was not exactly in decline, but <laughs> But it's, you know, I mean, this, this is, so, so the, the job of, uh, of our diplomats, our intelligence officers, uh, is, is, is hard. And I think, you know, sensible citizens, even after this report, should root for them to do a really good job. Because if they don't, uh, we have a problem. 
Well, let's uh, open this up to all of you. Do we have microphones that are coming around? I suspect we do uh, someplace. Yep. We'll start right up here in the front. Thanks very much. Um, David, David your, your last response probably <coughs> just uh, rained on this question, but I'm going to try it anyway. I, I was thinking about the arc of David Ignatius' novels um, as a reader. And uh, as I think I've said to you, um, I love them all. I really think this one is just stunning. And uh, believe it or not, it made me think about uh, a now uh, disqualified theory in biology uh, about ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That in the development from the embryo to the adult, uh, we sort of mirror how the, the species itself and the phyla developed. And I was thinking about how that might apply to the arc of your novels from the first uh, and particularly in the la when I think about the last three. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if in, in one sense, if we follow the arc of your novels, we are following the arc, are we following the arc of the technology? Are we following the arc of um, uh, the, the institution writ large that, that you're talking about, uh, and of course it always, if, if, if to the extent that that might be true, I, I sit here saying, I know he's thinking about his next one, and I wonder what that's about, but I'm not going to ask you what it's about. So the person who asked that wonderful question, and I'm going to have to decode the, the I won't even try to repeat the uh, the, the, the words is, is Gary Mitchell, uh, who's an old friend and writes the Mitchell Report. Um, I, I think that um, not surprisingly, in our uh, technologically sophisticated society, the advantage we've had in intelligence collection has been on the technical side. And so the role of signals intelligence, the role of the NSA, um, uh, the new uh, kinds of uh, intelligence gathered from platforms overhead and all sorts of things we don't even know about. Um, you know, that, that's, that's been a driver. The thing that, that the United States has never been as good at, which is um, recruiting human beings, uh, drawing them uh, into, sometimes uh, deceitfully drawing them into relationships, um, you know, what we, we call human, uh, which was the subject of my first novel and this brilliant operation. If you want to read a nonfiction account of it, I commend a book published this year called The Good Spy uh, by Kai Bird, which tells the now nonfiction story I told in fiction uh, in 1987. It's basically the same story. Um, you know, somehow the U.S. is going to have to get better at this process of uh, working pe with people, uh, getting under their skin, um, s you know, spending not just a few years, but you know, several decades working sources, working a part of the world, uh, keeping up with contacts. Uh, when I look at the intelligence operations that won the war for Britain, uh, you know, taking every agent that the, the Nazis sent to England and turning those agents and then feeding them false information. Um, when I look at an, if an operation the US, the Brits and the Jordanians ran against the Abu Nadal organization in the late 1980s where we fed them so much cleverly packaged misinformation that they basically took themselves apart. We, you know, we made each one think the, the one next to him was the enemy. What I see are models of what um, will help deal with this nightmare uh, adversary that we have now in Syria and Iraq. I really don't want the U.S. just to send in the Apache helicopter gunships, let alone the, the drones. You know, the idea that we can just, you know, kill enough of these people and solve the problem, I just don't believe it. I think the, 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 the way that will, that will be more efficacious involves human beings, relationships of trust, you know, kind of deep, 
carefully planned, long-term strategies. And um, uh, to repeat, uh, if you read my novels, you see a story of that kind of thing uh, in decline relative to the technological side. And I'd love to see that. I, it's, I think it's important that that be reversed. Again, these are not great American. We're just not very good you know, relative to others, we're not great liars. We're just, we're such a straight, straightforward people, generally speaking. So often, in terms of that kind of spying, uh, we have not been superstars. Other questions out here? Other hands? Right over here. Uh, either, David. Uh, has technology outstripped the ability of the oversight committees on the Hill to do oversight? Um, it's a great question, uh, Finley. The, um, I, I posted something yesterday afternoon saying that the glaring omission in Senator Feinstein's uh, report is to um, hold accountable Congress in its oversight of interrogation. Uh, you know, I mean, Senator Feinstein blames basically everybody in sight except her colleagues. And I think that's just, that's just wrong. That was not an issue that involved fancy technology. Um, you know, it's argued uh, by members of Congress who were briefed on these techniques that the uh, briefings weren't complete and they didn't tell us this. They didn't. But that, you know, that begs the question, so why didn't you ask? Why didn't you push? Why didn't you say, well, wait, wait a minute, you know, what, what, what I didn't understand what the, what, what were those techniques? I, I still, I, I, you know, I mean, that's their job. That's what oversight is. That wasn't a technological issue. Um, I, th I think, um, you know, if, if you look at the nominal oversight, you know, in theory, all these NSA programs were being disclosed to the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. And I think that's an example where, yes, the technology was so complicated, you know, whether the, the FISA court, which has also has a kind of oversight role, whether they're going to be able to, to genuinely understand this so they can make decisions about it, I just, I don't know because it's so complicated. But, but on, on that example, which is right before us right now, you know, it, it, the, the oversight process didn't involve any special expertise. It just involved asking questions. Right here. Yeah, Mac O'Dell. I'm a, a historic grassroots guy from the very earliest days when I joined the Peace Corps in 62. And I look at this from a different perspective, but I, I come up with a, a, a question. You talk about uh, oh, we're talking about increased transparency everywhere. Everything's talking about transparency. You're saying secrecy is out the window. It's not going to happen. We're not going to be able to keep anything secret. Uh, nothing's secret anymore. The hackers are going to find it no matter what we do. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about open government, transparency in government. At the same time, we also see that encryption, as I think you're saying, encryption will invariably fail. No matter what we do, it'll be another tier of encryption, another tier of, and that the hackers will get at that. So I wonder if we're, if this really isn't the strongest argument for what you're saying, that we've really got to get back to what we'd call human interpersonal intelligence, the, the, the kind of thing it's in the good spy. Um, and in your novels, I think, because we're not great liars, and we better just get on to the fact that we just need to be, develop our people skills, our diplomacy, our, <coughs> our intelligence of a, of a good human relations side, and that covers the spectrum from, from uh, volunteer service to military service to CIA and everything. You just, it's out in the open, get it out in the open, and let's just relate to each other as people. I, that's so well said. I, I, all I can do is, is endorse the, the, the essence of what you said. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, it's going to be very hard for any of us to protect secrets. It's going to be very hard for the government to protect secrets. Um, the thing I, I guess that, that worries me is that when the United States, let's say for a legitimate purpose, asks another country for its help in doing something that would be 
um, damaging, even you know, politically explosive for that country if it was disclosed, the ability of the United States to keep that secret, to keep the promise it's making to the other country, I think is diminished. And I think that's, that's a problem because there, you know, in this world, it is, it's really dangerous. Diminished, David, or after WikiLeaks and Snowden gone, that basically our closest allies believe we have lost all control of this and that the Snowden insider nature of it particularly undercuts it. Um, it, it, was, it was pretty devastating. It, as you see in the coalition that's ramping up to deal with ISIS, it's not entirely gone. I mean, the need for, there is no country on earth that has the power or even the ability to keep secrets that the United States still has. So people uh, work with us be, be, because they have to. I heard something the other day that was just, you know, so amusing. It was, it was somebody saying, ah, you know, we see that, um, this was a, a foreign head of government, we see that the Wiki, WikiLeaks disclosures were a CIA plot because... <laughs> Well, I get, I get this. It's so, it's so, so that this person said, you know, this showed that State Department officers are not capable of keeping their conversations secret because the WikiLeaks disclosures were all State Department cables so that people now will only talk to the CIA. You're so clever. You know, you're so... <laughs> so people, people can imagine, you know, even in the, in the darkest uh, moment that there's still a hidden American plot. Good. We have time for uh, just one or two more. Why don't we uh, take, uh, we're going we're gonna to do a, a lightning round here where the microphone's going to go to the two of you and then right up front here and, and then David can pick which of the questions he actually wants to answer. <laughs> my question, my qu my, it's Mike Pillsbury. My question is designed to help the sales of the director, which is already a bestseller. There's a profile in the novel of something called the CIA Information Operations Center. You make that unit and some of its members into heroes. I know quite a bit about the Information Operations Center. My question is, do you think what's in your allegedly fictional account might be the topic of a non-fiction Kai Bird kind of book in 20 years? Great question. Uh, Joe Onik, you talk about failures of, uh, of American intelligence recruiting uh, spies, disinformation. What about the more basic failures? Uh, the failure to understand what, for example, Shia control of Iraq might justify, a kind of thing that makes me ask, should we be really, should obviously be recruiting more hackers, but don't we need more Arabist scholars, historians, et cetera? And that that's the real failure. Uh, of intelligence, uh, not just the CIA, but the other agencies. A hacker Arabist would be actually a, <laughs> uh, that would be a great diversity hire. There are know? some <laughs> awesome <laughs> hackers in the Arab world. I mean, just just wait. Uh, and I think we had one last, last one right here. David, you spent a lot of time in the region, in North Africa and the Gulf and that was in the 70s and the 80s. Oh, yeah. My question to you, has the quality of our intelligence people deteriorated in the last 15 years compared to the 70s and the 80s? Because in the 70s and the 80s, we had the best people who knew the region, who knew the language, who had the skills. And when you look at Abu Ghraib and what has happened here, it shows that there's no lack of cultural understanding. Um, those are three wonderful qu questions from three people I, I uh, respect. Um, first, to uh, Mike uh, Pillsbury's uh, question about the Information Operations Center. Um, you know, the, the kind of uh, complicated uh, character, James Morris, who runs it, who through the book we learn more and more disturbing things about, is, is from that center. But then, so is one of the characters who ends up being a hero, his deputy woman. Uh, named Ariel Weiss. Um, the Information Operations Center, as, as, as much as I would like to um, you know, be able to write a, a, a tell-all novel uh, whose every detail is, is well reported, um, the agencies managed to keep um, uh, pretty well concealed, uh, even from a very hard-working reporter like me. <laughs> 
So, um, you know, maybe somebody will uh, get inside of it, um, but it's a part of the operations directorate that they've really uh, kept a lid on. And I'm sure you know, you know, people in government, uh, who served in government, know, know about it. It's, um, but, but I don't want to pretend that, that I know more than I do, because I don't. Maybe someday somebody will write about it, but I, I, there are things that actually do stay secret, and, and that may be, may be one of them. Um, on Joe Onyx's question about, you know, do we need, it, when, we, when we, we can invade Iraq and not understand that the primary beneficiary will be Iran, uh, you know, uh, potentially our, our most important regional adversary, what on earth, you know, did we think we were doing? I mean, you know, the, how incredible that you can, you know, have all these exotic techniques of intelligence and not get that basic point right. It is the case that there were CIA analysts who made exactly that point at the time. I mean, you know, if you look back at Paul Pilar's uh, uh, analytical writing, you know, I mean, the vice president tried to get him fired for saying things like that. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, the, the vice president and his associates went to war against the CIA's uh, analysts and some of the operators precisely because they were seen as raising too many objections to the to this campaign. And the, so, um, you know, even when those people exist and are telling these larger analytical truths, um, you know, people don't listen. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the, the terrible part. Uh, 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 you know, a friend likes to observe that the big problems in life are not the ones that sneak up on you. They're the ones that you s s stare right in the face. You see them coming, and you do it anyway. And Iraq is that way. You know, and I'm living proof of it. I have to be, you know, humble. It's such a nice occasion, people saying nice things about me. I mean, at the end of the day, after... You know, examining the reasons, arguments pro and con, I ended up saying that I thought invading Iraq uh, was the right thing for the United States to do. If there's anything I've ever written, I wish I could take back. That's it. But, you know, I don't think I'm a stupid person, and I certainly put in time trying to understand this, this part of the world, and, you know, I couldn't have gotten that more wrong. Um, finally, uh, Ode Aberdeen's uh, question about, you know, have we lost the, the best and the brightest. I mean, you know, the CIA of old, the Gentleman's Club recruited from Yale and Harvard and, you know, the clubbable, uh, you know, I used to say I grew up in the Spring Valley neighborhood and I used to say if you throw a rock in any direction, you'll probably hit a CIA officer's house. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, that, that, that world is gone. It's a, it's a, it's a different pool of applicants. Uh, the new pool has um, some weaknesses, it also has some strengths. I mean, you know, the, the younger officers I've met who really impress me often are, are from very diverse backgrounds. I mean, there are some brilliant uh, people, uh, you know, uh, African Americans, uh, Latino Americans, people from India, Pakistan, you know, all over the world who've come to the United States and are, I mean, I, I think are going to be incredibly good operations officers, in part because, you know, you won't say, oh, you know, I knew uh, Joe at the Fly Club, he's a first-rate officer. You know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have a clue. Um, the final thing I'll say that is different, you know, because I, I just can't make, what do I know? I don't know, you know, those people are, their identities are secret. But I, what I do know is that in the time that you and I are remembering, when all these brilliant CIA officers were getting inside every, you know, government and organization in the Middle East, the United States had the wind at its back. Everybody wanted to be our friend. If you were a, a rising businessman in, in Lebanon or a Palestinian working in Saudi Arabia or you name it, anywhere in, in the Arab world, anywhere in the world really, it was in your interest to be seen as a friend of the United States. And if people whispered about you, you know, you know he, he's pretty f friendly with the embassy, that would probably help your business career. We're not living in that world anymore. The wind is not at our back. It's in our face. And, you know, we, we just have to recognize that and know how, how difficult it's going to be. I hope the wind shifts 
and, and makes it easier. But the glory days, you know, I mean, they were wind assisted, as they say in, in track and field. And we shouldn't forget that. Well, David, thank you. Thanks for this great conversation. Um, to, to all of you, I remind you that Christmas is only two weeks away. <laughs>